Jawaharlal Nehru's ancestors came from these fabulously beautiful Kashmiri valleys. They were Brahmins, aristocrats of the Hindu religion, and the males carried the title Pandit, which means man of learning. It is believed that during the early 18th century, a forebear traveled to Delhi and served within the mighty Mughal's orbit. After the Indian Mutiny of 1857, and known to some as the First War of Independence and its crushing by the British Army, the Nehru family retreated to famed Agra. And in due course, to this city of Allahabad, where Motilal Nehru, the father of our hero Jawaharlal Nehru, became a highly successful lawyer. Matilal Nehru was a colorful extrovert who enjoyed wealth and found much to admire and emulate in the British way of life, represented by the elite of the British Raj. However, his wife, Swaruprani and the mother of Jawaharlal was a deeply traditional Indian woman and thereby between these two contrasting parents lies the enigma of Jawaharlal's outstanding life. Jawaharlal was 15 years old, he was taken by his father to England to receive the finest education that could be imagined at Harrow, where of course uh, Winston Churchill had recently attended. These two Harrovians later in life would become formidable adversaries. Jawaharlal wrote to his father I have no doubt whatever that my coming to Harrow is the right thing. But sometimes I feel rather lonely. Jawaharlal's housemaster, the Reverend Edgar Stogden, reported... Oh, a very nice boy. Quiet, very refined. He is not demonstrative, but one feels that there is great strength of character. I know that young Nero very specially likes the Harrow School songs. <laughs> In 
In 1907, Jawaharlal moved to Trinity College, Cambridge. I feel elated at being an undergraduate with a great deal of freedom. But soon, he was saying, I feel a foreigner, an intruder. East is east and west is west, and it is extremely difficult, even via Harrow and Trinity, for the twain to truly meet. During holiday time, Jawaharlal Nehru twice visited rebellious Ireland and he was deeply moved by the efforts of Sinn Féin, the Irish Freedom Party, to emancipate their hard-pressed island from British domination. And after the Irish Rebellion of 1916, Nero asked himself a significant question. But was that not true courage? which mocked at almost certain failure and proclaimed to the world that no physical might could crush the invincible spirit of a nation. Already his course in life was emerging. Jawaharlal Nehru was beginning to apply that noble Irish question to his own country India. From Cambridge University, he moved to the Inner Temple in London to become a lawyer like his father. Meanwhile, here in India, Motilal Nehru was uh, dabbling in politics. He had joined the Indian National Congress, at that time a moderate conservative political movement aiming to respectfully advance Indians within the British imperial structure. Matilal made a speech. John Bull means well. It is not in his nature to mean ill. When the son here in London heard, he was not pleased. As regards John Bull's good faith, I have not as much confidence in him as you have. And when Motilal embraced the British Raj to the extent of accepting an invitation to King George V's Royal Durbar in Delhi, it all became too much for the uneasy Jawaharlal. He had already dared to rebuke his loving father. The British government must be very pleased with you at your attitude. Matilal changed the subject to sex and an arranged marriage. You uh, must not confuse real love with a passing passion. And you know the arguments against uh, Indians marrying English women. Jawaharlal remonstrated. As regards the Delhi girl, surely she is too young for me. She was at that time 12 years old. I am nearly 10 years her senior. But Hindu custom overrode the British fashion and the young man, having passed his law examinations, dutifully returned to India and in due course married Kamla Kaur of good Kashmiri Brahmin stock. Jawaharlal Nehru was already the man between two vastly different cultures and he had been painstakingly placed there by his loving father. 
Young Nero agonized over his predicament. To some extent, I come to India via the West. And look at my country, as a friendly European might have done. For four years, Jawaharlal Nehru wandered somewhat aimlessly in the imposing shadow of his dynamic father. And then, in this city of Lucknow, he saw the little man for the very first time. He saw Mahatma Gandhi. Jawaharlal stated, the voice was soft and low, and yet it could be heard above the shouting of the multitude. There seemed to be steel hidden away somewhere. Under Gandhi's leadership, the smooth flow of British imperial order was disturbed. But prior to this, and to the Mahatma's horror, Indian political terrorism had erupted, and the British replied to this terrorism by enacting a hard set of laws based on the report of a Mr. Justice Rowlett. These laws did not dilly-dally. Indian religious political conspiracies are to be put down by trial without jury. And there is to be preventive detention for some without any trial at all. Jawaharlal stated, one might almost think that the object of the British measure is to create trouble. The Mahatma was asked, what can we do? Do? Once the Rowlett bills become law, we offer non-violent resistance. The light was emerging Jawaharlal Nehru exclaimed, Here at last is a method of action which is straight and open. The Mahatma proclaimed April the 6th, 1919 as the day to begin this campaign of non-violent resistance with a hatal, a national strike. The strike proved to be astonishingly successful and peaceful. However, on April the 9th, three days later, Gandhi was arrested by the British and immediately there was Indian violence in Bombay and other places in Western India. Gandhi, with his awesome capacity for truth, Blame not only the British administration for excesses, but also his fellow Indians for their violence. And of course, he also blamed himself. I have made a Himalayan miscalculation. We Indians have burnt buildings forcibly captured weapons and killed innocent people. A rapier run through my body could hardly have pained me more. Meanwhile, in this ever volatile city of Amritsa in the Punjab, a placard had appeared on the central clock tower. Prepare to die and kill others and elsewhere. Kick out the European monkeys. And so on April the 10th, the British arrested the two leading Indian political activists of Amritsar and immediately 
a far from peaceful Indian demonstration which was estimated at 40,000 strong crossed these railway tracks and advanced northward threatening the British residential area. Ironically, there were shouts of Gandhi, Ki Jai, Hail Gandhi. The British police, after giving several warnings and fearing the worst, opened gunfire and several Indians were shot. The massed demonstrators, enraged by the shooting, retreated to this city centre, looting banks and burning Amritsar's railway station. Four Europeans were trapped and were promptly killed, and a British woman missionary was also left for dead, though she eventually recovered. General Dyer, a British soldier, was urgently ordered to Amritsar to restore imperial law. But he pointed out to his superiors that he hadn't got the military manpower to achieve it. However, on April the 12th, he personally paraded around Amritsar with a detachment of soldiers and issued a military proclamation stating that all Indian political assemblies were prohibited until law and order were restored. On the very next day, General Dyer was informed that such a meeting, and a very large one, 20,000 people has been conservatively estimated, was being held within this walled area, called the Jallianwala Bagh. General Dyer, with 90 Gurkha and Baluchi soldiers, marched towards this massed assembly. General Dyer, at this very place, commanded his men to open fire! marched his soldiers away, they left behind them at least 379 dead and 1,200 wounded. In the House of Commons uh, here in London, the greatest and most uncompromising of imperialists, Winston Churchill, stood up and shifted the responsibility away from himself and his political ilk towards the military man. However, we may dwell upon the difficulties of General Dyer, upon the critical situation in the Punjab, upon the danger to Europeans throughout the province, one tremendous fact stands out. I mean the slaughter of nearly 400 persons. That is an episode without parallel in the modern history of the British Empire. We have to make it absolutely clear that this is not the British way of doing business. But of course, Churchill did not waver for one second over the necessity, in his mind, of the British to rule firmly in India. He challenged uh, his Prime Minister Lloyd George. When the Bolshevik armies are menacing Persia and Afghanistan, and their missionaries are at the gates of India, not only the League of Nations, but also the British Empire will wake up to the fact that Russia 
is not a negligible factor in world politics. The year was 1919. General Dyer was removed from his command, and not long afterwards, a broken man, and uh, only a few days before his death, he turned to his wife and said, I long to meet my God, so that I may ask whether, as a soldier, I did right or wrong in Amritsar. The question occurs to me, who was the truly guilty man at Jallianwala Bagh? The uncompromising imperialist personified by Winston Churchill? Or the professional soldier, General Dyer, who had been ordered to pacify an explosive Punjab? But the massacre of Jallianwala Bagh Seal the political unity and strength of the Indian Congress movement. The political moderates led by Motilal Nehru move closer to Jawaharlal Nehru's radical way of thinking and in close support of Gandhi's peaceful but activist policy. Jawaharlal expressed all of their feelings. I realize now how brutal and immoral imperialism is and how it has eaten into the souls of the British upper classes. The ordinary hard-pressed people of India, the undiscovered millions, have a capacity for recognizing human goodness. And already they were beginning to look towards young Jawaharlal. Several hundred desperate peasants asked him to consider their exploited plight. Here on the banks of the Jumna River, the young man from Harrow and Cambridge faced them and listened to them intently for the first time in his life. Looking at these people and their misery and overflowing gratitude, I was filled with shame. Shame at my own comfortable life and our petty politics of the city. A new picture of India seemed to rise before me and filled me with a new responsibility that frightened me. Jawaharlal Nehru, the man who was to lead India to independence, had finally found his true self. Uh, the British government then tried to cheer things up a bit by sending the uh, Prince of Wales on a royal tour of India. Jawaharlal and Father Motilal worked hard to make the Prince's visit a fiasco, and so on December the 6th, 1921, they were both arrested at their home, uh, here in Allahabad before being sentenced to six months each, Jawaharlal stated, I go to jail with the greatest pleasure and with the fullest conviction that in doing so lies the achievement of our goal. His dad said, It is now my high privilege to serve the motherland of India by going to jail with my only son. And then again, a tragedy occurred which brutally destroyed the Mahatma's edict for nonviolence. 
A crowd of Indian demonstrators attacked a British police station at a place called Chauri Chowra and burned to death 22 policemen. And again, Gandhi immediately cancelled his civil disobedience action. A Jawaharlal still in prison was hurt and shocked. Are a mob of excited peasants going to be allowed to put an end to our national struggle for freedom? Jawaharlal tried to swallow his bitter disappointment as he always did towards Gandhi. He is delightfully vague, but uh, we all feel that he is a great man and a glorious leader. But it was the first intimation that these two towering Indian patriots would diverge in method. Gandhi, the devout man of God, and Nehru, the honest agnostic. Uh, the British government decided that this was the time to tighten its discipline over India and having warily restrained themselves they suddenly and this time firmly arrested Gandhi. Jawaharlal who had been released from jail hastened to the great man's trial. Gandhi stated from the dock I believe that I have rendered a service to India and India by showing in non-cooperation the way out of the unnatural state in which both India and England are living. In my opinion, Non-cooperation with evil is as much a duty as cooperation with good. Mahatma was given six years and he confidently marched off to this Yerwada prison carrying five books which included Jesus Christ's Sermon on the Mount. Jawaharlal was rejuvenated as he grasped Gandhi's banner of freedom. We have shaken off the sloth of centuries. Today, India is respected. Where yesterday, we were despised as slaves. And again, he was arrested. Jail has indeed become for us a holy place of pilgrimage. To serve India in the battle of freedom is honor enough. To serve her under a leader like Mahatma Gandhi is doubly fortunate. The British gave him a sentence of 21 months and the conditions inside Lucknow Jail were made harder. The Viceroy stated we have no intention of converting their imprisonment into a comfortable lodging. In prison, Nehru heard an Indian patriot being whipped. And each time the lash hit his body, he shouted, Mahatma Gandhi, ki jai! Mahatma Gandhi, ki jai! Hail Gandhi. And Jawaharlal said of himself, uh, prison is making a man of me. But when he eventually came out of jail, he found the freedom movement exhausted. And turning to uh, Gandhi, he found the Mahatma's very personal philosophy, unhelpful. Gandhi said, freedom is an impossibility 
until we have boycotted British cloth. And the Mahatma perceptibly said of his young friend, you are halal, is one of the loneliest young men of my acquaintance. For the first time in their lives together, Jawaharlal Nehru found the time to consider closely his wife Kamla and his daughter Indira. My wife wants to play her own part in the national struggle and not to be merely a shadow of But now Kamala had contracted tuberculosis and Jawaharlal decided to take her to a sanatorium in Switzerland. And with them went their schoolgirl daughter Indira. And as uh, Kamala's health improved, Jawaharlal began to explore Europe. He went to Russia and peered at the results of their awesome revolution. I found the vast political and cultural changes going on in Europe and America a fascinating study. Soviet Russia, despite certain unpleasant aspects, seems to hold forth a message of hope to the world. The dedicated, unorthodox internationalist was clearly forming. And Kamla having apparently recovered, Jawaharlal hastened back to India, carrying with him his broader vision of the world. Now, there was no holding Jawaharlal back. And the British promptly provided him with a notable Aunt Sally. The British Tory government sent Sir John Simon and six other Britishers to India to investigate uh, possible constitutional advances for the subcontinent. But no Indians were included in the commission. Uh, Jawaharlal Nehru called them the seven uninvited gentlemen from England. The dominion status for India was discreetly whispered. Wherever Sir John Simon went, thousands of Indians chanted, Simon, go back! The commission, having heard the endlessly repeated words day after day, finally arrived at the Western Hotel here in New Delhi. In the middle of the night, Sir John had had enough. You might give us some peace at night. Oh, uh, those are not uh, demonstrators, Sir John. They are jackals. Jackal. Yes. New Delhi, the famed. British concoction had not long before been transformed from wild bushland. And the following day, as Sir John Simon and his British commission arrived at this Lucknow railway station, Nero faced, totally unarmed, charging mounted British police. I thought how easy it would be to pull down a police officer from his horse. But I did not raise a hand, except to protect my face. Besides, I knew well enough that any aggression on our part would lead to the shooting down of large numbers of our men. 
the Indian National Congress was about to vote for a new president. There were three nominations, Gandhi and Sadar Patel, the iron man who supported Gandhi uncompromisingly, and Jawaharlal Nehru, Gandhi's truant and errant child. Gandhi declined the leadership and bypassed Patel and turned to the agnostic internationalist. Jawaharlal, do you feel strong enough to bear the weight? If it is thrust upon me, I hope I shall not wince. He was now 40 years old. And the Mahatma, of course, had the influence to make Jawaharlal president of the Indian Congress. Gandhi said, he is pure as crystal. He is truthful beyond suspicion. The nation is safe in his hands. The Viceroy of India, Lord Irwin, carefully murmured, I desire that the utterances of Jawaharlal Nehru be watched carefully. Lord Irwin was right. Uh, from the British point of view, the Indian Congress has no training for organized violence, and violence is a confession of despair. But if only methods of violence will free us from slavery, I have no doubt that I will adopt them. Violence is bad, but slavery is worse. Independence for us means complete freedom from British imperialism. The flag of independence was unfurled on the banks of the Ravi River and thousands roared, Inklab Zindabad, long live the revolution. Lord Irwin, uh, His Majesty's Viceroy in India, was now definitely unnerved and he declared, the Indian Congress Working Committee is henceforward illegal. But he also tried to reassure the rebelling Indians. Now, the natural issue of India's constitutional progress is the attainment of dominion status. Then, adding to his aid, we are in India, my dear chap, to keep our tempers. But Winston Churchill wasn't unnerved. He addressed Lord Irwin. Dominion status can certainly not be attained while India is prey to fierce racial and religious dissensions. It cannot be attained while India's political classes represent only an insignificant fraction of the millions for whose welfare we British are responsible. Please don't think, Winston, that I am ever likely to forget the point of view that you are putting, or indeed that I differ from it. Half the problems in India are psychological. Case of hurt feelings. However, Jawaharlal had called the millions of India to heroic action and therefore he was once again a little disconcerted when the Mahatma addressed an apparently innocent letter to the poor Viceroy, Lord Owen. Dear friend, my ambition is no less than to convert the British people. 
through nonviolence and thus make them see the wrong they have done to India. On the eleventh day of this month, I shall proceed to disregard the salt laws. The British government monopolized the production of salt and they had placed a tax on this essential need of every poverty-stricken Indian. Gandhi planned a walk some 240 miles to this seaside village of Dandi and here illegally to collect a few pieces of non-government salt. Thousands of Indians walked to the Mahatma and details of the carefully planned journey echoed and re-echoed around the world. The Indian nation with the Mahatma broke the British salt law. Jawaharlal said, it seems as though a spring has been suddenly released and something over 60,000 Indians were jailed. Winston Churchill didn't underrate the threat of apparently innocent salt or anything else. Gandhism and all it stands for will sooner or later have to be grappled and finally crushed. It is no use trying to satisfy a tiger by feeding him with cat's meat. And so the British began to whack and very hard. Jawaharlal and his dad were arrested for breaking the salt law and put into this ninety central jail. And Motilal was not displeased. Now we are together again. And on May the 5th, 1930, Gandhi was arrested near Dandi while still making handfuls of salt, presumably. The strain on Motilal, the sometime virile high liver, became unbearable. Gandhi strove to give Motilal strength. We shall surely win freedom if you survive this crisis. I shall not be here to see freedom. But I know that you have won it. Shortly afterwards, he died in his sleep with Jawaharlal sitting by the bedside. They wrapped Motilal's body in the tri-colored Indian Congress flag. Jawaharlal remembered as evening fell on the banks of the river Ganges. The great flames leapt up and consumed that body which had meant so much to us. Gandhiji said a few words. Matilal's love for India was derived from his love for his son, Jawala. The stars were shining brightly when we returned. 
lonely and desolate. And then, on February the 17th, 1931, the British agreed to a momentous shift in their attitude to India. Lord Irwin invited Mahatma Gandhi to forget the past and look to the future. Here, in the Viceroy's palace in Delhi, the Mahatma agreed. It is alarming and also nauseating to see Mr. Gandhi, a seditious middle temple lawyer now posing as a fakir, striding half naked up the steps of the viceregal palace. On the other hand, Lord Irwin was at his Christian Best. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gandhi, we must drink each other's health. In tea. <laughs> but I shall drink the toast in water. And a pinch. Illegal salt. Salt. <laughs> and as the Indian was leaving, the Britisher said, Good night, Mr. Gandhi. And my prayers go with you. Namaskar. Excuse me, Your Excellency. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gandhi, here's your shawl. Uh, you haven't so much on, you know, that you can afford to leave that behind. And the Mahatma began his four-mile walk home through the night to report to Nehru and the other Congress leaders. At the end of these meetings between Gandhi and Irwin, a compromise was agreed. Indian civil disobedience was called off. Indian political prisoners were released by the British. And the private making of salt was allowed at the coast. And the Mahatma agreed to attend an imperial so-called round table conference in London to discuss India's constitutional advances. It was called the Irwin Gandhi Pact. The representatives of the two nations had negotiated face to face for the first time. In 1931, a new Viceroy was appointed by the British government, Lord Willingdon, and he was considerably less sympathetic than Irwin. Soon, nearly 70,000 Indians were politically detained, including, of course, Jawaharlal Nehru. This time, the British gave him a sentence of two years, again here in this Naini jail. And the Mahatma was arrested, and Jawaharlal's two sisters were arrested and imprisoned, and all of this was eagerly accepted. But suddenly, the unacceptable occurred. Swaroprani. Nehru's old, deeply revered mother was beaten on the head by the British police and was badly injured. Yes, she too was demonstrating. Trapped in jail, 
Jawaharlal now suffered torments. Dusty road of cesses. And I wonder how I would have behaved if I had been there. How far would my non violence have carried me? Not very far. I fear. In prison, Jawaharlal began writing a series of special letters to his daughter Indira. The first was written on her 13th birthday. You have been in the habit of receiving presents and good wishes. Good wishes you will still have in full measure. But what present can I give you from Naini prison? My presence cannot be material or solid. They can only be of the mind and spirit, such as a good fairy might have bestowed on you. Something that even the high walls of prison cannot stop. And in this prison, Jawaharlal also kept a diary. And in it, he stuck pictures of Harrow in England. And he made a list of great men who had gone to Harrow School, with particular emphasis on Lord Byron. He read the great Hindu epic, the Ramayana and the Gita, and the English poets, Keats, Shelley, and of course, Byron. And later in jail, Jawaharlal digested the seriousness of his wife Kamala's illness. To shield himself from that pain, he began to write his autobiography, but it was not easy. The thought that Kamala might die has become an intolerable obsession. Kamala, now desperately ill, was flown to a sanatorium in Germany. Under pressure from liberal spirits in Britain and in India, the British released Jawaharlal and he hastened out of India to be with her. Kamala said, Death is better than such a life. Even death is frightened of me. Jawaharlal said, Sometimes, looking into her eyes, I found a stranger peeping out at me. Their daughter, Indira, was sitting at the bedside with her father as Kamala died. The mother's last words were, Someone is calling me. And she gestured towards a, a shape in the room. The body was cremated and Jawaharlal took the ashes. India. 
The Indian National Congress was now the supreme organization working for Indian independence and Jawaharlal was its president. But there were dangerous religious divisions within the country. Part of the Muslim element, as against the uh, vast Hindu majority, was led by an eminent lawyer, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Uh, Jinnah had once been a formidable champion for a united Indian nationalism. But uh, various Hindu political factors were now transforming him into an unbending advocate of a separate Muslim state. Of course, uh, that other old Harrovian Winston Churchill thoroughly understood how a relative handful of Britishers had kept hundreds of millions of Indians in check. Emphasize India's indigenous religious divisions and thereby rule them. A divide and rule. Some uh, little while before, Hindus and Muslims had run amok and had killed uh, obscenely about 300 of each other Churchill said this massacre at Cawnpore is a portent because it is believed by some that we British are about to leave India the struggle for power is now beginning between the Muslims and Hindus British troops are even now pacifying the terrified and infuriated populace. But this present Muslim-Hindu feud is only at its beginning. And that Machiavellian provocative prophecy certainly helped the awesome concept that was beginning to live in Muhammad Ali. Jinnah's mind. The very limited concessions which the uh, Congress party had wrested from the British were put into operation and some provincial powers were extended to the Indians. But Nehru was still deeply depressed by any compromise over complete independence and so he began to travel through India, urging Indians to give further political support to the Congress party. But while doing so, he was also delving for his Indian roots. He traveled for 130 days. He covered 65,000 miles. And he saw and spoke to about 20 million people. And they saw and heard him. Sometimes, as I was passing along a country road or through a village, I started with surprise on seeing a fine type of man or a beautiful woman who reminded me of some fresco of ancient Indian times. India is a myth and an idea, a dream and a vision, yet very real and pervasive. There are terrifying glimpses dark corridors which seem to lead back to primeval night. But she is also very lovable. And none of her children can forget her. What 
is the secret of this strength? There seems to be something unique about the continuity of a cultural tradition through 5,000 years of history. A tradition widespread among the masses and powerfully influencing them. That vision gives me a new perspective and the burden of the present seems to grow lighter. But early in 1938, Jawaharlal's mother died and he sank deeper as he brooded on the condition of India and of the troubled world. He said to Gandhi, I want to freshen up my tired and puzzled mind. Jawaharlal left India, speeding compulsively to the festering centers of the impending European Holocaust. First, he visited the Republican forces in Spain, who were being assaulted by Franco, who was being assisted by Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Then to Czechoslovakia, which was undergoing the process of betrayal to Hitler by Britain and France. And Jawaharlal began to speak as a brave international statesman. We Indians have long experience of promises broken and betrayals by the British government. Yet it is well that this new Czechoslovakian betrayal is known to us also lest we forget. And then, on September the 3rd, 1939, Lord Linlithgow, the current Viceroy of India, made a shattering announcement to the Indian people. I hereby proclaim that war has broken out between His Majesty King George VI and Germany. Jawaharlal Nehru stated, one man, and he a foreigner, has just plunged 400 million Indians into war without the slightest reference to them. Lord Linlithgow invited the Indian leaders for a full and frank discussion. Jawaharlal asked His Excellency the significant question. How can Indians who are not free and who have been denied democracy be expected to fight for freedom and democracy? A little more slowly, Mr. Nehru, my, my slow Anglo-Saxon mind cannot keep pace with your quick intellect. <laughs> but Linlithgow was quick enough to reject Nehru's plea. And Jawaharlal responded, I am sorry, for in spite of my hostility to British imperialism, I have loved much that is England and I should have liked to have preserved the silken bonds of the spirit between India and England. Well, those silken bonds were being bitterly stretched and 30,000 Indians were arrested including Nehru during his trial, he stated, There are very few persons in India, whether they are Indians or Englishmen, 
who have for years past so consistently raised their voices against fascism and Nazism as I have done. And I am convinced that the large majority of the people of Britain are weary of empire and hunger for a real new democratic order for India and for all of Britain's colonies. But we have to deal not with the British people, but with their government and we have no doubt as to what that government aims at. We have therefore decided to be no party to this imposed war and to declare this to the world. It is not me, sir, that you are seeking to judge and condemn but rather the hundreds of millions of the people of India. And that is a large task, even for a proud empire. Perhaps it may be that though I am standing here on my trial, it is the British Empire itself that is on its trial before the bar of the world. I thank you, sir, for your courtesy. The judge sentenced Nero to four years rigorous imprisonment. And then Japan plunged into the war. The dilemma for Nehru and the Indian National Congress was now most extreme. Jawaharlal stated, We are not going to surrender to the Japanese invader. In spite of all that has happened, we are not going to embarrass the British war effort in India. However, that opinion was not unanimous. Among the distinguished Indian independence leaders who thought differently was Subhash Chandra Bose, who began to make his way westward to Nazi Germany and eventually ending up with Imperial Japan, where he began to recruit Indian prisoners of war captured by the Japanese for a force called the Indian National Army, which was meant to invade India with the hoped for all-conquering Japanese and thereby liberate India from British rule. But at this juncture, Gandhi overrode Nehru's troubled reticence to harm the fighting democracies led by Britain. The Mahatma issued an unequivocal ultimatum to the British. Grant us Indians full democracy or quit India. During 1942, the British began to defeat the Nazis in North Africa and Churchill roared at India like the arrogant imperial lion that he was. Let me make this clear. Lest there should be any doubts about it in any quarter, we mean to hold our own. I have not been made the king's first minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. The leaders of the Indian Congress, including Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal, were once again arrested. There was no trial this time. Nehru was incarcerated in this Ahmednagar fort, and he remained here for nearly three years. 
Inside this prison, Jawaharlal wrote a book, The Discovery of India. It was not less than his ultimate attempt to escape from Harrow School and Cambridge University. Jawaharlal sat in this very room and considered once again the significance that Indians 5,000 years earlier had been sophisticated enough to debate their human place in the cosmos. And Nero asked of our millions of people, how few get any education at all? How many live on the verge of starvation? If life opened its gates to them, how many among these millions would become eminent scientists, educationists, industrialists, and artists hoping to build a new India and a new world? And then the atomic bomb blasted across the face of this earth. The Jawaharlal Nehru, unlike them, saw it and heard it very clearly. Peace seems like a dream that has faded. And mankind apparently marches ahead to its doom. For though the atom bomb has come to blast this world, no bomb has yet touched the minds of the world's men of authority. Finally, Britain, with its allies, won the war. And here on this old Atlantic island, a very quiet revolution took place. A majority of the returning soldiers and the British people generally voted for a socialist government. The Indian political prisoners were speedily released, including Nehru. He had spent nine years in prison, spread across nine different jails. The socialist Prime Minister Clement Attlee spoke his unadorned truth. Britain will quit India by a date not later than June 1948, transferring power in the best interests of the Indian people. India must choose what will be her future constitution. I hope that the Indian people may elect to remain within the British Commonwealth. Jawaharlal Nehru was now the undisputed leader of the Indian National Congress. And the great battle for India's freedom was surely accomplished. And India firmly decided upon a democratic constitution. But that terrible religious political spectre that Winston Churchill was ever prophesying began to accelerate and threaten. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, at the head of his Muslim League, was not to be denied. By all the canons of international law, we Muslims are a nation. And a leader of the extreme Hindu Maha Sabha didn't help when he shot back. India is the abode of the Hindu nation. And Jawaharlal kept repeating, as long as I am at the helm of affairs, India will not become a Hindu state. Jinnah was relentless. Never have we in the Muslim League done anything except by constitutional methods, uh, but this day we say goodbye to constitutional methods. I will give the British and the Indian Congress a demonstration of bloodshed and civil war. And in Calcutta alone, 
Over 5,000 people were promptly murdered, Hindus and Muslims. As the Indian nightmare grew, the British government took drastic action and dispatched a new viceroy eastward, Lord Louis Mountbatten. The charming Lord met Jawaharlal and Mountbatten said, Mr. Nehru, I want you to regard me not as the last viceroy winding up the British Raj, but as the first viceroy to lead the way to the new India. And then uh, Mountbatten met Jinnah. And after the lethal chat was over, the viceroy remarked, my God, he was cold. It took most of the interview to unfreeze him. Nero, Mountbatten, and Gandhi fought to retain the blessed union of the Indian subcontinent. But Jinnah, at the helm of the Muslim League, was glacially adamant. India stands on the brink of a ruinous civil war. Pakistan is the only solution. The sailor in the Viceroy expressed the situation graphically. India is a ship on fire in mid-ocean with ammunition in the hold. And so Nehru addressed Mount. As you know, we are passionately attached to the idea of a united India. But we now accept the partition of India in order to avoid conflict and compulsion. At midnight on August the 14th, 1947, British rule over the subcontinent of India came to an end. And here in this constituent assembly chamber in Delhi, Jawaharlal Nehru began to speak. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. And immediately, the massive obscenity of religious slaughter began. As Hindus and Sikhs made their escape from Pakistan southward, and Muslims hurried northward to the safety of Pakistan, perhaps half a million people no one knows the correct number of casualties or ever will. Here in Delhi, Muslim refugees took what shelter they could in these ancient remains of the Mughal Emperor Humayun's tomb. Jawaharlal and Gandhi walked amongst them, giving what comfort they could. An old Muslim and his wife, in ragged clothes and both suffering from knife wounds, stood up to greet the good Hindu. The Mahatma said, 
hang my head in shame. Nero towered above religious bias, and enraged he said, I will not tolerate this. I want Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims to live like brothers. Immediately the Mahatma commenced to starve himself and Jawaharlal joined him and the mass murders began to cease. Everything may have appeared to be on course for a peaceful future, but Gandhi had a premonition. If I am to die by the bullet of a madman, I must do so smiling, and God must be in my heart and on my lips. The madman's name was Naturam Gautse, and as the Mahatma walked through this very garden, on January the 30th, 1948, Gautse made an obeisance and then fired three bullets into the old man's chest. As he fell and momentarily before death, the Mahatma was able to say, Hey, Ram, which means, Oh, God. The murderer was a Hindu Brahmin. Gautse felt that Gandhi had demonstrated too much sympathy for the Muslims. After a painstaking trial, Gautse was hanged. A retribution which the Mahatma would not have approved of. Shortly afterwards, Jawaharlal broadcast to the Indian nation. Friends and comrades, the light has gone out of our lives and there is darkness everywhere. The light has gone out, I said. I was wrong. For the light that shone in this country was no ordinary light. It represented the eternal truth. And then, virtually alone, Jawaharlal Nehru took the helm of the biggest democracy in the wide world and he began to work towards enlightenment. During 1948, Lord and Lady Mountbatten left India and in particular, they left their friend, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. At the great farewell function, Jawaharlal said, I have wondered how it was possible that an Englishman and an English woman could become so popular in India during this brief period of time. You may have many gifts and presence, but there is nothing more precious than the love and affection of the people. Certainly all three of these memorable people loved each other. But the pressure of the world outside of India continued to harass Nehru and he proceeded to confront the hard facts. 
there are the problems of what are called foreign possessions in India. French Pondicherry, Portuguese Go and the rest. We want a peaceful solution. But it is quite clear that there is only one future for these possessions and that is complete integration with India. Well, the uh, French left quietly, but the Portuguese under their dictator Salazar did not wish to move. They had made Goa part of Portugal more than 400 years before, and a very large proportion of the population were now Christian Roman Catholics. He waited for 15 years and then influences in his Indian government pushed him and into Goa went the Indian Army and the Navy and the Air Force. There was little resistance from the Portuguese. But world opinion was surprised, and Jawaharlal was not happy, not happy at all. He said, the fact that a war is a little war does not make it less of a war. But how high Jawaharlal Nehru soared above the usual details of petty national disagreements. And he brought a new concept to contemporary international thinking. Why commit India to the democratic capitalist powers or to the communist totalitarian regimes? Would the interests of humanity be served by the world being divided into two power blocks? What about love, he seemed to ask. The shade of Gandhi must have been very clear. However, for most of his life, Jawaharlal did favor one foreign country above all others, China. Way back during the year 1939, when the Indian National Congress was struggling desperately for India's independence, the Congress managed to send medical aid to the fighting Chinese communists. And then, in the year 1950, the first shock was experienced. China brutally overran Tibet. The truth is, Nehru was hurt and ominously puzzled. His decency couldn't quite comprehend how his beloved China could have perpetrated such an act. Jawaharlal's words were mild. The Chinese have acted rather foolishly. And it is natural that our enthusiasm for supporting China wanes somewhat. But our general policy towards China remains the same. But now, Jawaharlal was faltering, and his faith in humankind had been disturbed. Nehru made an agonizing effort to resign from the Premiership of India. I feel now that I must have a period when I can free myself from this daily burden. India had long ago raised the frightening question. After Nero, who 
And so Jawaharlal was persuaded to stay on. But events were moving from bad to worse. Inside Tibet, the Chinese were waving Mao Zedong's little red book and they were systematically destroying Tibet's ancient, invaluable culture. Nehru stood up in this Lok Sabha. We have every desire to maintain the friendship between India and China, but at the same time we have every sympathy with the people of Tibet. And we are greatly distressed at their hapless plight. It was a compassionate and courageous statement. Jawaharlal had begun to digest the bitter fact that China was now unpredictable. He was right. Three years later, the Chinese army poured over India's border, high up in these Himalayan mountains, and eventually in massive array. Sinister mystery piled upon sinister mystery. Suddenly, the Chinese military avalanche halted and then, without explanation, withdrew in good military order. Nehru tended to work for about 16 hours per day. One of his secretaries said, I am unable to give a purely physiological explanation for the amount of work that Nehru is able to achieve day after day. It is really a case of the utter triumph of the spirit over the body, of a consuming passion to work for India. Nehru's target was to convert India's economy into that of a modern state and to fit my country into the nuclear age. But no nuclear bombs. After 17 years in control of India's destiny, food production had risen to nearly 90 million tons, and industrial output had risen by 94%, and life expectancy had increased from 32 years to 50 years. Yes, those 16 hours each day had been worthwhile. In the year 1960, Prime Minister Nero visited Britain to attend the Commonwealth Prime Minister's Conference. He visited his widower friend, Lord Louis Mountbatten, and he revisited Harrow School, where he re-sang the old school songs. In the vicinity of that uh, other old boy, Winston Churchill, Churchill remarked with tears of astonishment in his eyes, Nero, demonstrates no resentment towards me. During this period, Jawaharlal spoke to a Marxist journalist. We must find ethical and spiritual solutions. What you say raises visions of Mr. Nero in search of God in the evening of his life. Hmm? Yes, I have changed. The human mind is hungry for something deeper 
in terms of moral and spiritual development. Without which, all material advances may not be worthwhile. There is the message of the Buddha, a message of peace that is particularly necessary in the world today. Jawaharlal would not, could not relinquish the values of the Buddha or of Mahatma Gandhi over that matter of himself. He continued to urge India forward, though the Chinese invasion had broken him physically. Old as we are, with our Indian memory stretching back to the early dawn of human history, we have to grow young again with the irrepressible spirit and joy of youth and its faith in the future. And he declared his final life's creed in very simple language. I am not wedded to any dogma or religion. But I do believe in the innate spirituality of human beings. I do believe that every individual should be given equal opportunity. And I dislike the vulgarity of the rich as much as I dislike the poverty of the poor. Suddenly, it was the end. His daughter, Indira, was at his side and her blood was transfused into his stricken body but to no avail. Jawaharlal Nehru died in this room on the 27th of May 1964. He was 74 years old. By the side of this bed on this table was a verse of poetry written by the American Robert Frost. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Jawaharlal had been carrying this poem in his pocket for some days. About noon on the day of the traditional cremation, an earthquake shuddered through Delhi. And Hindu priests chanted mantras the Jat Regiment played Mahatma Gandhi's favorite Christian hymn, Abide With Me. There were muffled drums, and gun salutes were fired, and the military played the last post. Jawaharlal Nehru's will and testament was published. I am conscious that I too, like all of us, am a link in the unbroken chain which goes back to the dawn of history, in the immemorial past of India. I am making this request that a handful of my ashes be thrown into the Ganges River at Allahabad to be carried to the great ocean that washes India's shores. The major portion should, however, 
be carried high up into the air and scattered from that height over the fields where the peasants of India toil and so become an indistinguishable part of India. Jawaharlal had kept some of the ashes of his beloved wife Kamla for 28 years and now these two entered the ancient Thank mm-hmm. you.